थैंक यू वेरी मच आलोक सर एंड थैंक यू फॉर कंसिस्टेंटली इन्वाइटिंग मी एवरी ईयर एंड आई थिंक कमिंग रेगुलरली सिंस लास्ट फोर टू फाइव ईयर्स एंड सिंगल एज अ सिंगल पर्सन ही इज डूइंग अ ग्रेट जॉब इज माई सीनियर फ्रॉम के जी एम सी सो माई जॉब इज टू टॉक अबाउट सडन कार्डियक डेथ हाउ टू अप्रोच सो वट डू यू मीन बाय सडन कार्डियक डेथ सडन कार्डियक डेथ इज फॉर एग्जाम्पल पेशेंट मे हैव नॉन स्ट्रक्चरल हार्ट डिजीज और यू मे नॉट टू पेशेंट हैड अ स्ट्रक्चरल हार्ट डिजीज एंड विद इन फ्यू अवर्स ऑफ सिम्टम्स पेशेंट सडनली एक्सपायर्ड बिफोर रीचिंग हॉस्पिटल एज सून एज पेशेंट रीच एज हॉस्पिटल एंड पेशेंट एक्सपायर्स एंड यू डू एन अटॉपसी एंड यू फील सम सम स्ट्रक्चरल हार्ट डिजीज और कोर्नरी ब्लॉक और वट एवर दैट्स कॉल्ड सडन कार्डियक डेथ बट इफ देर इज सडन अरिग्निया डेथ सिंड्रोम इज माई स्लाइड आर सीन Okay. Sudden arrhythmia death syndrome is sudden death, and you have done an autopsy. You are not able to find any structural abnormality in the heart. Within few hours, patient expired, and only on genetic analysis you could diagnose it's a long QT syndrome or CPVT or Brugada syndrome. This is sudden arrhythmia death syndrome. And from our country, there is no systematic data how to find the cause. But the simplest way, because we don't do too much of a molecular autopsies or systematic way of autopsy is verbal autopsy i'll talk about what do you mean by verbal autopsies and commonest reason all over the world is coronary artery disease followed by some known structural heart disease it may be dilated cardiomyopathy we usually call it idiopathic because we have not diagnosed it or some known congenital heart diseases and incidence is like you may get a negative autopsy into 20% of the cases and you may not find any structural abnormalities in almost 10% of the patients so i'd like to i feel that you should have a high index of suspicion in the family or in the patient who can have tendency for sudden cardiac death for example this is a young lady who came to my opd in the device clinic having a pacemaker no complaints after pacemaker echo is normal it's been few years of pacemaker and when you do an ecg after pacemaker you can say a sense sweep is nothing but can you see there are stt changes which should not happen in a young girl which looks little bit glaring you won't have so much of an stt changes i didn't do much i just started asking family history she says my brother had a pacemaker followed by he had a vt and given an icd sitting in some foreign land mother had a sudden cardiac death at 43 years of age and she had a pacemaker already mother's brother had dilated cardiomyopathy he had a sudden cardiac so we know that we are dealing it with some inherited cardiomyopathy which has a tendency for involvement of conduction system as well as muscle and it's an autosomal dominant pattern correct this we have read in mbbs also the pattern is autosomal dominant this helps you to suspect the what can be the mutation or where can be the mutation because chances of picking up the abnormality is very high and you know that what are the different i'll not go into much details because uh, you may have laminacy mutation as cn5a mutation mitochondrial dystrophy and you should see the systemic body of the patient so she didn't have any other systemic abnormal no neuromuscular disease no eye involvement nothing so you do genetic and she is one of the desmenopathies and why do we want to know this we want to know this because brother also has vt and required icd mother had sudden cardiac death you should evaluate her for the chances of having a vt and whether she needs an icd or need medications increase antiarrhythmic drugs at least if you are not giving a device so if you see the data from the world over the the commonest cause of the inherited cardiomyopathy or chandelopathy is commonest is long qt followed by brugada then cpvt and there are three structural heart disease out of this commonest we are able to diagnose because echo we pick up is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy followed by dilated cardiomyopathy laminacy uh, laminacy mutation uh, lv non compaction sorry and the last which is not shown here is i would say is arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy or we call it arvd but it can be lv involvement as well so the most important is verbal autopsy or verbal screening is taking a comprehensive comprehensive history proper detail history and then a simple evaluation starting from family history patient's old medical records screening of all family members physical examination for subtle structural abnormalities ecg extended halter echocardiography there is a reason i put a question mark in front of arvd i'll tell why maybe doing stress tests i'll show few case examples and last comes the genetic we should not do genetic first because we won't know where we are going i'll tell you again the reason and the provocative test provocative tests are highly underutilized because the maximum drugs which are required for provocative tests are not available in our country except for few like epinephrine is available 
oral flicanide is available, isoprenaline is available. One point of thing I'll say, if you have a probe and or index patient comes to you, try to do screening of the family. Your yield improves by more than 40%. So always do a family screening. One case example I'll show that this 25-year-old lady came because her sister expired suddenly. She has no complaints, zero complaints. And when you do a simple ECG, you start with an ECG. We all know as a cardiologist, it's not a normal ECG, right? Because there is an LA enlargement. There are some STT changes. There is some hypertrophy seen. And she had, you do simple like, oh, she has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. What happened when they are very young? They may not have much symptoms. Especially female. I think one of our colleagues spoke about female not having typical symptoms. 40% is a huge number. Or they may deny a symptom. They may not be moving around. Youngsters, when all other organs are normal, they may not have much symptoms. And she has a proper HCM and she didn't have any symptom. This is one of the case I think I have presented in one of the meeting here only. 17 year old boy, survivor of sudden cardiac arrest, came to emergency. Actually, this case was di di been managed as Caesar since long. If you see, he came to an emergency because I could see VF, I knew it's a, something else going on, and ECG is abnormal. Because you are suspecting something, you want to do some changes. Can you see a picked up Brugada? And the way you do it is. Because you bring all the unipolar chest leads to the parasternal region. In Brugada, you have abnormality in the right ventricular outflow track region. That's why you are able to pick up the Brugada pattern. And you do genetic test. The genetic test was positive. Provocative test can unmask good number of uh, patients. And you need a proper monitoring. You need infrastructure. You need defibrillator of the patient. And ECG should be done continuously. You cannot do provocative test and discharge patient in 2-3 hours. Especially flicanide challenge test when we do. You cannot give injection and discharge after 4-5 to five hours. Because flicanide half-life is quite long. So patient may have a VF storm. So be cautious about it. And the problem with provo provocative test is sensitivity and specificity is still unclear. And false positive tests are still there. That's the reason I think in the real world data it's been less utilized. And the problem what I said is genetic. You cannot just jump on the genetic first because if you do, my cases I have like more than 200 patients data. Out of that one, one third are VUS, that is variants of unknown significance. If I want to convert it into a pathogenic mutation, I have to screen the family which is comparatively difficult in our country. But if you keep doing it and keep diagnosing it, it will be very helpful because now the world is going towards mo molecular therapy. Like now we are getting treatment for HCM. We are going to attack for placophilin mutation. So if you have a diagnosis, then only we'll be able to treat. This is an example of 10-year boy. Recurrent syncope, structurally normal heart. Not much STT changes, but we can see there is a sinus arrhythmia. Sinus arrhythmia is normal in 10-year children, actually. But the rate is also comparatively slower. How to go about this? Simple. As I said, start with the family history. This is the child. If you ask family history, first cousin had a C at 12 years of age. So you have some significant family history. What I did was I started with instead of treadmill, I this is I'm sorry. This is a this is a treadmill connected to the patient, and you. Ch ch uh, Keep on taking the raw ECG. The most important in pediatric age group, when you do treadmill, don't do for 9 minutes and send. Because a technician does, he'll say 9 minutes, good exercise capacity, good rate and they'll send off. Because pediatric, their heart rate starts going up after a long time. So keep them, make them keep walking and be aware. As soon as like after 14-15 minutes of walking and running, you can see there is a first PVC came. As soon as it came, I stopped. Stopped him immediately, made him lie down. And then you see the salvos of this. This is a classical of, we all know that it's a classical of CPBT. You could make the diagnosis. And then after that, it settles in the recovery phase. And it's a calcicostrin mutation in this patient. So you could reach the diagnosis in the child. This is a very interesting patient. This is a comparatively two years old data. This is a 21-year-old male. One episode of blackout. He, he works in some hospital. In that hospital, he goes, and the usual diagnosis is 21 years. The commonest thing is NSTMI, normal epicardial coronaries, or we make a diagnosis of recanalized LED. And we keep giving drugs. We keep bringing cholesterol down, down, down for the patient. He still has symptoms. Nothing you do. You, you, I, what I did was I asked family history. Mother died at 43 years of age. So I gave him this extended, he was, this is during COVID time, he left. So it's connected and can you see one thing is glaring. Can you see this T-wave abnormalities in this patient? I'll, I've just highlighted this. So this is at the same rate 
in the same position from the t wave upright around the same time the t wave has become biphasic so there is some repolarization abnormality now someone will talk to me like if there is a change in the position because filter settings are completely different when you do extended monitoring as compared to ecg right we don't talk about stt changes whenever we connect extended monitor because t wave and st segment are low amplitude waves so this is an accelerometer in the three axis x y and z axis without movement of the body without much change in the heart rate you can see dynamic stt changes in this patient so there is a repolarization abnormality and you do analysis of the qt you do get higher qt you ask him to do an ecg and you pick up long qt in the patient and this is a gene positive patient this is the last case after this i'll stop 19 year girl recurrent palpitation history of blackouts no family history so what do you feel the baseline ecg looks okay and you have rvot pvcs which is commonly commonest diagnosis is rvot pvcs are idiopathic and you do as electrophysiologist we do just ablation and send off the patient so one thing you can do when any patients with the because 19 year comparatively young why she should, should have blackout and all because rvot vt is usually not syncopal they they'll tolerate it very well so only thing i did is fontan leads what do you mean by fontan leads are instead of unipolar leads i like brugada i did brugada i didn't get anything so fontan is you bring your right arm to the uh, sternum uh, to the base of the uh, manubrium sterna here and then the lead uh, la lead to the xiphi sternum and left lateral lead to the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line and you have f1 f2 f3 that means i want to bring out changes in the rvot because arvd is a triangle of dysplasia right and you can pick up some abnormalities here and you do an mri and you can see the microaneurysms here why i am saying this is already there are a lot of question when you talk about old task force criteria there were a lot of limitations of task force criteria in arvd because you should not wait for the disease to reach at this stage to make diagnosis of arvd this is one of my patient i have done the dissection after heart transplant i have done a biopsy of this heart and you can see its whole rv is been changed by a fat you have islands of muscle only septum ARVD septum spares only septum as a muscle everywhere there is a fat you should not reach this stage to make diagnosis of ARVD right so now you have uh, now you have a padua criteria which has involved genetic uh, evaluation also and which have involved stt changes also with the family history so it will not suddenly patient will not have a complete fibrofatty involvement it will start with this tiny microaneurysms and slowly the disease will progress and this is a placophilin mutation in this girl so you cannot treat her like a regular rvot pvcs so this is my last slide like this the we don't have we may not be able to diagnose in each and every case so one thing is comprehensive history is very important and if you have extensively evaluated for example if you have taken a family history if you have done an ecg if you have done a decent imaging and everything is normal then outcome is decent at least you can tell that an importance of family screening family clinic or family screening or try to have a cardiogenetic clinic thank you very much thank you madam for a nice presentation i just want to know uh, one thing for our audience what are the uh, in your cases we do first investigation as ecg so uh, what are the uh, important things in ecg would like to tell the audience that we should be suspicious about the uh, presence of any arrhythmia in the patients i think we all have read in dm because the ecgs which i showed was norm normal mostly normal ecgs unless you see gross stt changes or gross fever with normality or for example unusual bradycardia unusual pvcs or pacs i have last week only one lady came in my opd she had some history of uh, weird feeling dizziness feeling ent evaluation brain evaluation everything done on halter she had pvcs which was quite frequent but it's a single lead halter so i don't know what is happening i auscultated as sit i sat down for some time for 5 minutes i was checking her pulse while asking history i realized that pvc is coming i made her lie down in the device clinic i connected 12 lead ecg and i told them leave it connected for 15 minutes or half an hour if you see pvc pick it up because if you have a 12 lead morphology of the pvc you know from which part of the heart is coming it may help you to reach the diagnosis
So subtle abnormalities like acidity changes, try to measure QT interval, try to see the rhythm or bradycardia is there or some PSAs are there, I think that may be helpful. The, I think the only thing we are not doing is, is asking meticulous family history at least up to two generations. Thank you, ma'am. And uh, one important message that uh, a majority of patients have seizures. They, uh, if we do an ECG, uh, sometimes we may find some cardiac anomaly in the ECG. So, all these patients who are having seizures, even the children and even adults, majority of patients have uh, this complete hyper disease or hyperdermatic seizures and they may be dead. So, all these patients who have seizures, uh, an ECG should be at least done to find out any basic uh, anomaly in these patients. Thank you. Now I request Dr. Vivekananda to give memento to Dr. Dalvi. Thank you.